All right, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Are you excited it's Friday? Wow. I wasn't expecting that response. All right, if you make your ways in, in and uh, grab a seat. While you're doing that, I have two giveaways, the two last giveaways this morning. I have a Faith FM shirt for the first quiz. And I'm going to take a first hand up on the count of three. And you've got to answer the question from this week's presentation. All right, you ready? Your arms all ready? You've been practicing all night, I know. Getting your reflexes ready to go. Here we go. Count of three. One, two, three. I think it was you over here. Yeah, you, yeah. Um, Ray. Is that Ray? No. Dotted top lady. Spot lady. Come on up. What's your name? Kayla. Kayla. Kayla, for your chance to wear this amazing shirt, all you need to do is answer this question. From uh, which day shall we pick? All right, the very first presentation, let's go back to Monday. Yes. Three things yes. that Jesus says we absolutely need if we are to be servants of God and follow him wherever he leads us. What are the three things he counsels us to get? Number one? Gold. gold. Is that right? Yes. Round of applause. That's one out of three. Two. The robe. The robe. White robe. Is that number two? Very good. And number three? The eye cell. Eye cell. Is that the right? Yeah. Round of applause. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. For the amazing Faith FM Mission Mug, you absolutely need to give these to your friends, leave them in your workplaces, all that sort of stuff, because you can scan this phone. People scan out of curiosity, and they start listening to Faith FM right on their phone. To get this one, on the count of three, get your hand up, and then you'll be asked a question. Okay, you ready? One, two, you, false start, come on up. She's super eager. And she's wearing a star, and that means things. Yeah. Okay, what's your name? Nola. Nola. All right, Nola, for your very own Faith FM mission mug, you need to answer one really simple question, and that, what, that is, yesterday... We were looking at three chapters in Revelation as the center of the book and its theme and its climactic sort of pinnacle. What was the one word I used to summarize those three chapters? One word. Three-letter word starts. Congratulations, you won the Faith of Mission Mug. Remember, I'm trying to give away stuff. I'm not trying to get you not to get it. All right, thank you very much. Let's pray as we get started on our last presentation. Father in heaven. This is your book that you chose to give us as a revelation of your son and what he is doing in the great plan of salvation in getting us to, into that kingdom of heaven. Bless us now as we delve into this last topic of this little mini-series of revisiting revelation. Help us once again to have understanding of these amazing passages of scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's do a quick review. We have been looking at our chapter map of the book of Revelation. We have been focusing in this short little five. By the way, I've had a lot of good questions and they, people have been asking, hey, are you going to do a Q&A section? Honestly, it never crossed my mind. No one, none of the organizers thought about it either. So we weren't really geared for any Q&A time, but maybe next time. Is that a good idea? Um, but in the meantime, if you've got questions, I do a radio show um, every week where I take up questions that people ask. Feel free to throw them uh, to me on the radio program, The Faith Experiment, or you can uh, if, subscribe to me on YouTube, and I post stuff there all the time in this sort of space as well. And I'll give you the links to that at the end of the presentation. But if you've got really good questions, and some of them are really good, but they require a lot more time than what I've got here, and it's not because I don't have an answer, I've got an answer, but it's just I don't have time. And what the goal of this series is, is to do one really important thing, to help you see that you need Jesus. Did you see that this week? You need Jesus. You need him in every aspect of your experience and your salvation. That's why Laodicea, most important thing. And I've tried to condense just the highlights to help you see that in the context of the book of Revelation. I haven't been focusing on beasts, I haven't been focusing on all the plagues and the seals and all that sort of stuff, not because I don't think they're important, but because what I'm trying to communicate in these five hours that I've been given is you need Jesus and here's why in the grand scheme of things. 
Now, yesterday we talked about the war in the context of this, this um, experience of salvation we've been given, but in the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Today, what we're going to do is finalize looking at what we are expected to do because we're walking with Jesus, all right? So we've been focusing primarily on this slither of time from the end of the great pro prophecy of Daniel 8.14 and 1844 to the point where we're calling probation ending or time no longer for salvation. Jesus wants to come back. And so we're looking at these layers. In the first layer, I've been hammering this every single presentation so that you get it. You need this. This is the solution to being a Christian in today's generation, in today's society. You need Jesus' faith. You need Jesus' righteousness. And you need your eyes open with his gift of prophecy he has given us. We've looked at the characteristics that God expects his servants to have. And you will get those, every one of those characteristics if you take his righteousness and he'd have his faith. So it all hinges on that message of Laodicea. We looked at the trumpets briefly, chapter, uh, trumpet number six, trumpet number seven, and saw how God was preparing and announcing that judgment is about to begin between the sixth and the seventh, and at the end of the seventh, his kingdom is made up. All things are gathered together in heaven and earth, and it is absolutely and a beautiful sight. And then yesterday's presentation, we looked at these three central climactic chapters within the book of Revelation and how the theme of the, of the chiastic structure, the, the pinnacle point is that there, is war, there was war in heaven, the war between family, family of God, and then that has trickled all the way down through the ages of time and through to the location here on earth. And then ultimately we followed it yesterday in chapter 12, verse 7, all the way down to verse 17. And we found that that war, the last wave of that war by Satan himself is against God's last fraction of the period of time of Christianity. It's called the remnant. And it's there that we left with that picture that war is inevitable. But there's no picture of how it will be fought in chapter 12, verse 17. There's no picture of who wins in chapter 12, verse 17. So God does something amazing for us who are, are walking with his righteousness, walking with his faith. Our eyes are open with his gift of prophecy. He does something amazing for us. He says, here's how the devil is going to wage war against you. Chapter 13. And he says that there are three distinct stages of this war. Yesterday, we, we went through this really quick. The sea beast is the, the puppet to this war. He is the front man, so to speak, but behind him is the puppet master, the one pulling the strings who is Satan himself. He's the dragon. This sea beast, he comes on and he creates the front, the counterfeit front to Jesus' ministry. Everything Jesus does in the ministry of salvation, this power counterfeits. And that's what the devil's first plan is. He needs to take our attention off Jesus as our Savior and put it onto something else. And that's what that sea beast is all about. And I shared with you yesterday that that is symbolic of the papal power that arose and ruled for those periods of time. And then as it comes down in 1798 at the end of verse 10, in verse 11, an earth beast shows up. And the earth beast is really in this story for one real reason. It has the ability to force the world to go back and do what that beast failed to do during the Dark Ages, and that is to get universal worship. Because really, when the, beast when the first beast receives worship, who gets the worship? It is Satan. And what is the whole focus over? Worship. So then in chapter 13, beginning in about verse 14 and 15, we see that the second power, which we've identified as the United States just very briefly, it does something remarkable. And I, I, I have done, I haven't got it recorded, so don't ask me, but I have a, a four, four one-hour presentations just on how the earth beast operates in this passage, word by word. It is incredible. It starts off by exercising. How do you, what do you, what do you exercise for? You exercise to build up your strength. And so this power comes on the world stage and starts exercising. And what the Bible says is it exercises all the power of the first beast. The first beast was the um, papal Roman system. But where did the power of papal Roman come from according to verse 2? It comes from the dragon who literally was pagan Rome. So the United States starts exercising all the power that like pagan Rome had. What was pagan Rome's power? Military. And so the U.S. comes on the stage and starts doing all the things that, that Rome, the pagan Rome used to do, 
And then it gets to the point, there's a transition in verse 14 and 15, where now it goes, hey guys, we've just made fire come down from heaven. Not literal, okay? Let me be clear, not literal. Fire comes down from heaven. Now, as a result of this, you should go do something as the people of this country and make an image that speaks. This is the language of legislation. So something happens in a transition, the third and final phase of Satan's war against the last day remnant of Christianity is this. Create an image to that first sea beast and this image has a real bite to it. If you don't go along with it, you're dead. And to make sure you think it's a good idea to go along with it, you can't buy or sell either. And so that's why yesterday we looked just briefly. I've had people, I've been a Christian now for 20 years. I can't believe it's been that long. I thought it was sure six months when I first started reading these prophecies. Six months till Jesus comes. But as I look back now over the last 20 years, there's no way he could have come. I mean, maybe he could, of course, the rapid one last moment's going to be rapid. But what has happened, people have been saying to me, there's no way universally they can stop you from buying and selling. That's impossible. And if they can't do that, they can't coerce you into their will and all that sort of stuff. The, the, uh, the, 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 the they's of the world. You know how they always say, they are doing this. They, who are they, right? People have been saying, that's not possible. They can't do it. Well, I showed you yesterday that without any even slight, and I'm very, very careful. I'm not into, uh, I like a good conspiracy theory, all right? But I'm not into teaching it. I'm not into preaching it. If it's not a fact, Stay away from it. What I shared with you yesterday were facts. The world is moving towards a digital currency controlled by central banks. That's fact. And that is what I'm suggesting is showing that we are living in a generation that can see this book fulfilled. 20 years ago, I couldn't say that. I, was, I, I said, I, I can see it coming, but now we have seen it come and we are watching it happen right now. That's what I shared with you yesterday. So all of that is not to scare you because we are servants of God. Amen? We have his faith. We have his white raiment, his, righteous, his righteousness. We have his eye salve, and we are just following that lamb wherever he leads us. Too many times this book is shown in Adventism as a book to get you super pumped and excited because of fear and because of what the newspapers are saying. I didn't share newspapers yesterday to try and get you excited. I showed to convince the, you that Revelation knows what it was talking about. But don't forget, the story in Revelation is Laodicea. It's not the beast, it's not cryptocurrency, it's not digital currencies, it's Jesus, okay? So that's what the devil's going to do. He's going, I've got my plan. I'm going to get you guys in this war, this last moment of, of my attack against the church. I'm going to raise up a counterfeit system to, to wow the world into an alternative way of salvation. And then I'm going to get some power to really give it some teeth, so to speak. And then they're going to work together to make it possible that every single person on this planet has to choose. That's his plan. So, again, if John got this and it ended there, we'd be like, man, that does not look good for us. Because it ends with worship or die. That's how chapter 13 ends. I'm so glad it doesn't stop there, aren't you? We go to what? Chapter 14. So that's where we're going to spend a bit of our time now in chapter 14. The first thing you'll notice, if you have your Bible, this isn't on the screen, in fact, I'm just going to paraphrase for the sake of time. In chapter 14, verse 1, the very first words are what? You tell me. Very first words, chapter 14, verse 1. Then I saw. Okay, so in chapter 13, I saw a beast come out of the sea. I saw a lamb right out of the sea. They create an image to the beast. And if you don't worship, you die. What's going to happen next? Well, then I saw. Read along with me. It's not on the screen. Then I saw a what? Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Notice what God does here. This is why I love being a follower of God. God goes, listen to me. You know how I told you to get that faith and that white raiment and that ISO? Yes. You know how I told you, invited you to follow me wherever it's Yes. You know how I've been leading you all these years? Yes. Well, now I'm going to give you a taste of the future. What is it? There's a lamb on Mount Zion and there are previous sinners and rebels from planet Earth with him. Some of you got it. 
God is showing us that in the end, he wins. We haven't even got to how. He's just said, listen, chapter 13, this is what the enemy is going to do. It's going to get bad. Trust me. But don't worry, because I'm going to show you the end. The end is I win. The lamb on Mount Zion is language of victory. And not just victory over God winning against the devil. God has sinners redeemed with him. That means somebody heard the message and chose to join God's kingdom. Satan said, no one wants you, God. They're all done. I've got the whole earth. And God said, hey, there's one servant down there. His name's Job. 144,000 stand Mount Zion, the servants of God, is God going, they love me. They chose to follow me wherever I would lead them, away from their rebellion, or away from their addictions, away from their sin, and I've led them to my throne, and I've won. Oh, come on, that's your amen cue. All right. Man, you guys are hard. Follow the language now in verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5. What do we see? We see palm branches being waved like crazy. Victory language. We see shouts of many, many waters. Victory. Jesus has won the battle of the great cosmic conflict. And then in verse... Oh, you guys are getting better. And then in verse 5, look at what it says. Here they are now, and they're standing. What are they doing? What was the question right before Jesus returns? Who is able to stand? These people. And who are they? Servants of God. Who are they? The people who listen to the message of Laodicea. If you get one thing from this whole week, you leave here going, man, that message of Laodicea is the most valuable lesson we have been given as Christians. Don't, don't get caught up in all the debate. Anyway, get sidetracked. So, they're standing before the throne of God. So, here's what I'm trying to say. Verse 1 to 5 is a summary of the future. Now, this is supposed to be God's chapter going, this is how I'm going to fight back. All right? He takes five, by the way, chapter 13 has how many verses? There's 18. It takes 18 verses for God to describe Satan's plan. In chapter 14, the first five, there's 20 verses in chapter 20, that's uh, chapter 14. The first five verses is God going, this is a beautiful sight. This is amazing. This is wonderful. There were humans who were in the family of Satan who have chosen to follow my son and come back to the family of God and we're just celebrating. I won the great controversy. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm sure God's not saying this in a way that like, he's not worried about the ones that are lost. I'm not saying that. But I like to focus on the fact that he wins. All right. So that's verse 1 to 5. Now, we're going to jump down to verse 14 to verse 20. Well, okay, I, I should read that. Why? Because they're in the forehead. Okay, last part. Why are they winners? Uh, why is God won? Because he's got servants with his character in their forehead. That's the point there. When you go to verse 14 to verse 20, you read something amazing. This is, again, this is God's war plan here. This is how God's going to fight against the sa uh, Satan's war plan. In these verses here, I want you to notice the language. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. You see language like this. It says, and then I heard a voice coming out of the temple of heaven saying, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap because the harvest of the earth is ripe. The wheat and the tares have now reached maturity. Everyone knows what fruit they are. You're either the servant of God or you're a servant of Satan. You can't serve two masters. All that rebellion that we've been messing around with here and later, see, we're a little bit rebellious towards God, a little bit righteous. That's all gone now. It's black and white. You're either a wheat or you're a tear. The harvest is ripe. And the command says, go on, thrust in the sickle. They've been waiting to say this longer than you've lived. They're just waiting to say this, these angels, thrust in the sickle, because this is the language of second coming. So that's verse 14 to 20. So I thought this chapter would be God's war plan. Basically, all he's saying is, I've won, and I'm coming back to claim them. That's an amen point. 
It's all right, you guys will... This is, well, actually, I'm pretty depressed now because this is the last time. I was going to say, you'll get it right, but you've only got a few more minutes. <laughs> so why and when? Because the time has come for you to reap. It's ripe, it's ready. The followers of God, the servants of God, they're there. And by the way, what makes them a servant of God? God looks down and goes, they're all wearing Jesus' robe. They're all carrying Jesus' faith. Their eyes are wide open and now they're coming home. That's the difference. On the contrast, you have all the rest of them going, hide us from the wrath of a lamb. It's oxymoronic. Okay, so big picture, where is the war, God? Where's your side to this battle? What are you going to do? Now, if you're a Bible student, and I hope you all are, there's a big gap in chapter 14 on my slide, isn't there? What verses are missing from there? Verse 6 to 12 or 13. Does anybody know what those verses could be summarized as? You guys are Bible students. I want to suggest this morning that Satan has three ways that he is going to try and build his attack and try and defeat God through us, his church, or the people on earth, but primarily us, because he's going after the remnant. And he takes 18 verses to tell us how he's going to do that. God comes along and says, it's, that sounds bad, I know, I get it, I know you could be fearful, but don't worry, because perfect love in me and fear, uh, peace in me casts out all that fear. Let me show you, I win. This is what's going to happen, but don't forget, I win. And to prove that I win, I'm coming back for you. I'm, I'm going to come and harvest, don't worry. But in between those two bookends of chapter 14, Jesus wants us to know that he has actually got a plan. He actually has got a plan of how he is going to deal with this beast powers, how he's going to deal with Satan's attack. And his plan is, verse 6, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the everlasting good news to preach to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. That is the same group of people that the sea beast is getting to worship. If you read from verse 1 to 10, it uses the exact same terminology, that every nation, kindred, tongue, and people will wander after the beast. So in chapter 13, you have the beast power, which is basically the architect Satan working through his front man, the papacy, with the help of apostate Protestantism, this, uh, this military machine and this, this uh, global connection of the world. Working together, his goal is to try and persuade the same audience that the first angel is going to. So essentially, you know how I said yesterday that the war in heaven was a political war because of the way the Greek renders it? That political war that starts in heaven over the character of God and the law of God, it ends up being played out between chapter 13 and 14 on earth. Whose side are you going to choose? The same people are being canvassed for their vote. Do you choose the beasts, which is ultimately Satan, or are you going to choose the lamb? And so this first angel is directly at odds with the first beast in terms of an audience. Then verse 7 comes in and says, saying with a loud voice, and then we get the message of the first angel. But I want you to notice that the message of the first angel in verse 7 is actually a broader explanation for the word good news. Because what's going to the world is the good news, the everlasting, the eternal good news. Now, when we think of this as Seventh-day Adventists, we all think we know what we're talking about. Because we've been talking about the first, second and third angel's message for the last hundred plus years. And so if I say to you, do you believe in the everlasting gospel? Your answer is... Now, if I ask you, write me a paragraph on what that means, you start scratching your head. 
At best, you write down, Jesus died on the cross for sinners. That's not wrong. But is that really what Jesus is saying? That's the message that needs to go. Let me show you. If we come, oh, let's go here. So a global message, all right? All right, let's continue. Three angels' messages. So they're going to deal with all that. Let's get through this. Okay, let's deep dive into the first angel. So we have an everlasting gospel being preached to those that dwell on the earth. In the Gospel of Mark, which is the first of the Gospels that were written, it begins with saying, this is the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Gospel means good news, and so we have good news always being followed by the word of. You see that? So the good news can't be in isolation. It has to be connected to something. You can't just say, I've got good news. Well, what is it? Well, I have good news. Yeah, but what's the good news? I have good news. You can't do that. If I say, I've got the gospel, and you say, well, what's the gospel? I have to say, it's the gospel of or about something. Are you with me? And so here, when the very first time we find it written in the New Testament, it was explained as the good news is of or about who? Jesus Christ, who happens to be described as the Son of God. So Jesus Christ has the good news. That's what Mark is implying. When you jump down into verse 14 of chapter 1 of Mark, it says that after John was put in prison, Jesus comes to Galilee. He's just left the wilderness in the context, dealing with the temptations. He comes out and he is preaching what? The gospel. So Jesus comes out of defeating the devil. He says, guess what, everybody? I've got good news. I've got gospel. And if they were to ask, well, what's the good news about? What's the gospel about? Jesus' response is not what you and I would say today. We would say, oh, the gospel is Jesus died on the cross. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, my gospel that I have is the gospel of the kingdom of God. So the eternal gospel, the everlasting gospel, the everlasting good news is something to do with the kingdom of God according to Jesus. Now you and I sit here so far removed from Jesus' day that we don't have a clue why that's good news. But if you were living in that day, there were five things that you were expecting. Or when you heard that word kingdom, because it's good news about a kingdom, when you heard that word kingdom, there are five things that would come to your mind immediately because you had been waiting for a kingdom to be formed and re-rescued for about 600 years or 500 to 600 years. Because the Jewish people had lost their last king when Babylon took the, the, the part of Judah into captivity to finalize off the, the captivity to Babylon, they hadn't had a king since. All under Babylon's reign, they didn't have a king. All under Medo-Persia's reign, they didn't have a king. They were allowed to go back and rebuild and restore Jerusalem, but they didn't have a king. Then Greece comes along. Alexander the Great came to destroy, Greece, uh, destroy Jerusalem. And the uh, rabbis come out and say, hey, you're mentioned in our book, the book of Daniel. He reads it. Alexander the Great reads Daniel chapter 8, and he's like, nice, I'm Greece. This is 200 years before you say, yeah, all right, I'm not going to destroy Jerusalem. I'll march right around and destroy everything east. And I'm, by the way, I'm going to leave with you some, some scholars, and I want you guys to translate these texts, the Old Testament, into Greek. That's the Septuagint today. So Alexander the Great, he's not giving them a king. He's just ruling around them, or including them. Then comes along Rome, and Rome says, you will have peace or you will die. <laughs> and Rome rules, and they put in a little puppet regional, we call him King Herod. He wasn't the king of Jerusalem or king of Israel. He was just a dude that they put as a puppet in the territory to try and appease the masses. And so for this last period of time, almost 600 years of time, the Jewish people have been waiting for a kingdom, their kingdom, to be restored. And they've had this hope on these prophecies talking about a promised king to come. We call him Messiah. They called him Messiah. But he's going to sit on the throne of David and rule for how long? Forever. Everyone's been waiting for this for 600 years. Every time they get together, hey, what do you know about the king? Oh, I heard there's a guy called Bar-Jesus out there in the wilderness. He's a, he's, his name's Jesus, which means what? Savior or deliverer. Maybe he's the Messiah. And so there's a whole bunch of whack crackpots running around trying to pretend that they are going to be the solution and salvation for Israel. 
The second thing that they're all thinking about when you hear the word kingdom in 30, uh, 27 AD is the reason they want the king to come is because the king's function in that time period was to do two things, to rescue and to provide for the people. So if the promised king hasn't come, no one's going to rescue us. When he comes, he will rescue us and he will provide for us. He will be the great Messiah. So they're waiting for this person. Now, some people decided, you know what? If we just make sure we're prepared for when Messiah shows up, we'll be ready to fight with him to destroy our enemies, whether it was the Greeks, the Media Persians, or the Romans, or the Babylonians, didn't matter. It's all the same problem. So some people in Jesus' day decided, you know what? Let's go and train out in the bush and prep ourselves for when he shows up so we're ready to fight for him and with him. They called themselves the Zealots. You heard of them? So they're off all like learning how to do self-defense and martial arts. Well, not martial arts, but you get the idea. They're just waiting for the king to show up so they can help him win the battle in redeeming. The third thing that the Hebrew people were looking for when they heard this word kingdom is they're looking for the rule of God to be restored. You see, the law of God in a Jewish mind does two things. It, re- it gives us freedom and it gives us justice. It gives us freedom because if everyone under the kingdom is keeping the same law, I'm sure that no one's going to steal from me because we all understand that's wrong. I'm sure no one's going to steal my beautiful, amazing wife, right? No one said amen. I know what you're thinking now. All right. So there's freedom, but there's also justice because we all know what the consequences are if you violate the law. So the, Israel, uh, the Hebrew people are like, when will God's law be exalted in our kingdom and in our land once again? And so a bunch of people thought, why don't we do this? Why don't we, if, if we could just maybe keep the law perfectly for at least seven weeks, seven Sabbaths, then Messiah might come. So let's create a whole bunch of rules that protect us from accidentally breaking the law. So these people came on the scene called Pharisees. And their goal and their motivation was, if I can keep you from even walking too far on the Sabbath with my rule, then I'm sure you will never, ever work on the Sabbath. And if I can keep you from doing this, then you won't do this. And so these were protections that humans created because they were hoping that if we can keep the law, Messiah will look down and say, all right, time to send the king. The king will show up. The zealots are ready. Everyone's ready to go. Were there Pharisees in Jesus' day? Absolutely. Absolutely. The fourth thing that people are thinking about this kingdom in Jesus' day is the subjects of the kingdom, and that was a no-brainer. It was the descendants of Abraham exclusively, only, ever, full stop, period, exclamation mark. And those pesky little cousins of ours, those Samaritans in the north who intermingled into those pagan tribes, they're a bunch of dogs. And those Greeks and those Gentiles, they deserve what's coming for them. And we can't wait till our promised king comes and redeems and rescues us and puts us back on the world stage, exalts our law and identifies us as the people of God once again, our rightful place. That's why they were so messed up in the way they thought back then. Not like us today, you know, we're so much more evolved. And the fifth and final thing that that word kingdom has packaged into it in a Hebrew mind in Jesus' time In fact, it's way before Jesus' time. It goes way back to the Babylonian time. But you can't have a kingdom without having a territory. And so these these poor Hebrew people have been scattered and some of them come back and they form these little clans and they're sort of settled all around Jerusalem. That's like the last stand now of where the the, uh, children of Israel's descendants are now living. But when that Messiah comes and those zealots unite and the, the priests uplift the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, all that, and we're, we're seen as God's people once again, we're going to get our full territory back. And so everyone has been talking about the kingdom in the Hebrew culture and context and the Jewish con- uh, context as well. And so Jesus shows up in this environment. He's in the wilderness. He's just faced off with who? The devil himself and one. And he comes out and he says, I have good news of the kingdom. And I'm sure that's where everybody's ears stopped. 
What's the good news of the kingdom? What's he saying? Does he know something we don't know? People flocked to hear him because he had good news about the kingdom. But Jesus said the kingdom of God. When the disciples followed Jesus, all their thinking is the kingdom of Israel. Do you know what they were fighting about for three and a half years? In fact, on the last week of Jesus' life before the cross, the last argument we have recorded of the disciples is they're arguing who will be the greatest in the kingdom when Christ takes the throne. Even after the resurrection of Jesus, as Jesus has been here for 40 days and he's about to send the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1, the very first thing that the disciples ask Jesus in Acts chapter 1 is, Lord, will you now at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus, I love how he says, he says, listen, the times and the seasons are not yours to worry about. Leave that to the Father. But here's what I want you to do. He's a good teacher. You're always uh, fixated on this kingdom of Israel. Let me take your, just, just don't worry about that for now. Let me take your attention and put it over here. I need you to stay here in Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Then what I want you to do is to go and be a witness for me to the whole world. Okay, you got that picture now? If you went to Paul, or not Paul, but you went to Peter, James, John, those guys on that day, and you said, hey, what's the gospel? They'd say, well, the kingdom of God is here, and we need to take that to the whole world. That's the message. Now you come down to Revelation chapter 14, and we ask in 2023, what's the gospel that has to go to the whole world? Our response is, Jesus died on the cross. Now, is that in that message? Absolutely it is. But what's the first part of the message? The promised king has come. How do we know? I'm so glad you asked. Let me take you on a tour of the Old Testament prophecies, pinpointing with accuracy, not just the time, not just the place, but the person of the Messiah. There's about half of our fundamentals in explaining the promised king. But then we come to the second one. Well, why did the king come? Well, he came to redeem us. Now, you know what's interesting? Jesus didn't redeem from the Romans. He didn't redeem from the Greeks, the Medo-Persians, or the Babylonians, and not from... Who's in power here in New South Wales? Again, just changed, didn't it? Your politics here? Who's in power? Like, okay, I don't really care what his name is, but Labour, okay? So Jesus didn't come to redeem you from Labour or the Liberals, or the Greens, probably should, but anyway. He didn't come to deal with politics. Instead, he came to cast out devils. He came to heal sick people who were believed to be afflicted by Satan. Jesus just goes, you know what? You think they're all, healed, uh, they're all controlled by the devil, and some of them were. He says, I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to rescue from the real root problem here. All of you getting into politics, you're all nuts, because you'll never be right. There's no, nothing, nothing in human politics. They're all just, they're all. The root problem here in this world is sin and Satan. And so Jesus shows, I am him. And so we explain to people, listen, Jesus came to save you from the power of Satan and sin. Well, what's sin? I'm so glad you asked because the next thing Jesus came to do is to teach us the law. The Sermon on the Mount, the longest teaching of Jesus, you know what its number one goal of that sermon is? Go read it again. I guarantee you'll see stuff you've never seen before. From beginning to end, all the way through, Jesus is teaching one main point. What it is like to live in the kingdom of God. How does it start? The multitude came. He sat down with his disciples. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And when they were seated, Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, very first words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Then he moves on, he continues on. Every single thing is about the kingdom of God. The next chapter, he says, listen, anybody teaching that the commandments should be abolished, they will be the least in the kingdom of God. Those who teach to do so will be in the kingdom of God. Then he talks about how to pray. What does he say? Pray after this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom, what? Come. Your will be done. Where? On earth. Everything in that sermon is describing what it's like to live in heaven's kingdom, not our kingdom. 
And then he says this remarkable thing. You cannot serve two kings. He says masters. Sounds like Laodicean message. You can't sit here and be, I'm a Christian in the last days, but I'm rebel and I'm loyal. No, you can't. And so Jesus' message of this gospel is the first three things is to say, this is who I am. I have the power to save. And then he says, let me redeem you. Let me save you. Let me pull you out of that addiction, out of that sin. And then he says, let me show you what heaven is actually like. And when I say heaven, I'm not talking about the place where angels are playing. I'm talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. What it's like to live in God's universe compared to what we've experienced, which is Satan's. Once he's got those three things out of the way, the logical question is, well, how do I become a subject of God's kingdom? So Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus and says, Nicodemus, except a person is born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. The only way to be a subject, to have a a citizenship ceremony is to be born again. That's it. And then when we understand that, Jesus says, listen, I've got a place prepared for you. I'm going to prepare it for you so that when I finish that, I'm coming back to take you to be where I am there in the kingdom. So this is the kingdom. When we come back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, it starts off by saying, listen, now John wrote this. This wasn't written by Ellen White. John wrote this. John was there when Jesus taught this stuff. And when John goes, this is verse uh, 6, I haven't got on the screen. Verse 6, he says that the, the everlasting gospel goes to all the world. John knows what the gospel is. It's the gospel of the kingdom. How do we know that? What's Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 say? And when this gospel of the kingdom goes to all the world, then the end will come. Not when COVID version 5 comes out. Not when the central bank digital currencies are fully evolved and rolled out. That's not the sign. There's one, by the way, oh, I could lecture you on this. Matthew 24, we make a great mistake when we say it is the signs of the times chapter. No, it is not. The disciples never asked for signs. They asked for a single sign. Read it again. Read the question in verse 3. They said, show us the sign or tell us the sign of your return and the end of the age, and so on and so on. They ask for a single sign, and then Jesus says, listen, 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 listen. Don't get deceived on this, because there's going to be a lot of deception. There's going to be deception in the Christian world, deception in the religious, uh, sorry, in the political world. There's going to be battles and fights. There will be pestilence. There'll be earthquakes. But this is not the end, he says. It's the beginning of sorrows. And then he says, then there'll be rising up against him, this one, this one, this one. And he says, but he who endures to the what? To the nothing in that chapter at that point is the signs of the end. The only sign he gives is in verse 14. He says, You want the sign? I've given you all the warning and all the context. Look, it's gonna get bad. It's gonna get bad. Chapter 13 has to play out. It's gonna get bad. But that's not the sign. You could maybe go, well, it's indications we're moving on. Sure, but that's not the answer to the question. What's the sign? The sign is this, when this gospel of the kingdom of God, hang on, Ah, now I've got to go through it all. When this gospel, this good news of the kingdom of God goes to where? All the world. Then the end will come. If you're waiting for something else to happen, like counting earthquakes, counting, and I do it, I'm interested in it, but I know it's not the sign of the end. It's just showing that things are getting worse and we need Jesus to come back. The one thing that shows that Jesus will come back is when you and I get off our big behinds and we do what we're told to do. Take the gospel of the kingdom to all the world. Are you with me? All right, how much time do I have? I've got i got 14 minutes. That's not much. Let's keep going. All right. So let's deep dive now. So in verse 16, we've got a very clear picture. The gospel of the kingdom is going to all the world, every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. Now, here's what Revelation does that is profound, that we miss, not misunderstand, but we, we, we don't appreciate, as I think John and the early Christians would have appreciated. And that is, in this verse, it has taken those five principles of the kingdom that they understood in their time, 
and it's just, it's just pulled it apart and condensed it and simplified it and just dropped it in your lap for something so simple, so easy just to take to the world. Let me explain what I mean. Saying with a loud voice, and I've highlighted it for you, the ingredients. Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him. There are four things here. I'm going to go through that as fast and as deep as possible in the next few minutes. So these are their ingredients. I, 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 I shudder to ask you. If I was to ask you to explain, by the way, we're studying this in this, this quarter, aren't we? The three angels. If I was to ask you, what is the fear of God? What does it mean to fear God? 99.99% of you will say to respect and reverence him. Amen? That's not wrong, but it's more than that. This is a deep dive, so you expect it to be a bit deeper than that. So we're going to look into that. And I want you to notice this. The same way Jesus gave us wretched first, then miserable, then poor, then blind, then naked, there was a sequence. There was intellectual reasoning why I believe Jesus gives it in that order. The same is true here. He gives us fear God, then give glory, then judgment has come, and then worship him. He gives us in that order. And I want to show you why I believe this is important. Let's focus on the first one, fear God. This is going to be fast. By the way, at the end of this presentation, you have a link to download all this stuff if you want it. In chapter 20, verse 20, the book of Exodus, I want you to notice what happens. They've just received the Ten Commandments. There's been thunder and lightning. It's terrifying in verse 19. The people are freaked out. And they say, Moses, do not let God speak to us or we will die. Read it in your Bible, Exodus chapter 20, verse 19. Then the next verse, Moses responds and says to the people, do not fear. Fear who? And do not fear what? God, right? God destroying you because that's what they were afraid of. In the previous verse, the thunder, the lightnings. I mean, you imagine how it'd be. You think you know what a holy God is? You have no idea. You stand in a holy God's presence, you'll soon realize how sinful you are. And they recognized it. And they're like, Moses, don't let him talk to us. Instead, he talks to you, you talk to us. And we'll do it because we don't want to die. Moses says, no, 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 you got it all wrong. Don't fear God. For God has come to test you and that his what? Fear may be before you. So what Moses is basically saying, don't fear God, but instead fear God. Just to really mess us up in English. But it's really quite simple. God does not want us to fear him with our knees shaking because we think he's going to lightning bolt us like they did. That's not the fear of God. That is a fear of God, but it's a very, very unhealthy one. But what God does want, he wants you to have fear. What does that fear look like? That the fear of God may be before you so that you may not sin. Now, don't get all freaked out yet. Some of you are going to get on your edges of the seat and go, oh, I'm waiting for it. Just wait, 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 wait. In the first reference in the Torah we have, in fact, Abraham is the first reference, but here's the second one. The fear of God is connected to sinning no longer. Does that make sense? Because what was terrifying them was because of their sin, they're going to get wiped out, annihilated. And Moses is saying, no, 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 no. God wants you to have fear for him, but fear that leads to a departing from sin. Notice this now. Here's Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright. Before who? Before God's throne. And one who, now here's the definition of what that actually looks like. What's the blameless and upright person look like? One who feared God, and as a result of fearing God, what did he do? He shunned evil, which is sin. God is saying to Moses, my people will have a fear for me that causes a result of shunning evil or sin. Job is an example of that. Let's have a look. We go to Job chapter 28, verse 28. This is a poem in Hebrew. It says, And to man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. When we look at this poem, it's the rhyming of ideas. The fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. Depart from evil, that's understanding. On one side, you have wisdom rhyming with what? Understanding. On the other side, the fear of the Lord is rhyming with what? Departing from evil. This is a consistent teaching in the Old Testament. To have the fear of God means that you hate evil, you hate sin. 
It continues. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And what? If you're keeping his commandments because you fear God, what don't you have? Oh, you're all getting really quiet now. Don't forget Laodicea. How are they keeping the commandments? How are we keeping the commandments? We have his righteousness on us. That's what keeps the commandments. If you think you're going to, I've been trying for many, many years. It doesn't work. You're not convinced, are you? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the one. Fear of God. Notice again, the pattern of Scripture is the fear of God is you have a distaste for sin so much that you would rather go to prison than sin. Why did I say that? Because there was a young man, Joseph, who was confronted and given the opportunity to indulge the flesh. And his response was, how can I sin against Potiphar? No. No. How can I sin against my family name? Nope. How can I sin against God? The fear of God was his mindset. And as a result of that, he went to prison. He would rather have gone to prison than to indulge with sin because he saw the sinfulness of sin on this end of the spectrum and the holiness of God on this end of the spectrum. And he said, that's what attracts me, not that. Are you with me? Let's continue. Um, I've got six minutes. Do not, sorry, yeah, do not be wise in your own eyes. Yeah, that's good advice, everyone. Fear the Lord and... Can you see a pattern here or not? The fear of God, the fear of the Lord is the same thing. It's not because we're terrified of God. It's just that we hate evil. We hate sin because it is the opposite of who we love. It continues. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is... I love these verses. You can't argue with them. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Here's another one. Proverbs 16, verse 6. In mercy and truth, a true atonement is provided for iniquity. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And it says, and by the fear of the Lord, one does what? So here's what the Old Testament, the New Testament, all the prophets are saying together. If we are not having a, the right kind of fear of the Lord in our existence, in our life, in our being, we will not want to depart from evil. We will love to have our little hand in it and play with it and go, oh, it's not so bad. We make evil appear less evil to justify us to stay with evil. But at the same time, as we do that, we have less and less fear of God. Because now we don't see the sinfulness of sin, we can't really see the holiness of God. So the fear of God in the Bible, all the way through all the texts and all the prophets, is this. As you understand the holiness of God, you now hate the evilness of sin or the sinfulness of sin. Did you ever wonder why when God came down to Adam and Eve in the garden and they've sinned, he said to them, I will put enmity. What's that word mean? Hatred between you, the woman, the church, and you, the devil, sin. I'm going to put the hatred there because we don't even have the hatred for sin. We love sin. We're, we're We're like, we're down. But if we accept the hatred for sin from God that he puts in, not me, not you, he puts it there. Now, all of a sudden, we hate that sin so much that we start being repelled. And by being repelled from sin, where are we moving towards? Moving towards God. Do you know what that hatred was, that enmity was? It was Christ dying on a cross. That's what the verse says, Genesis 3.15. He's going to put enmity between the woman and the, the serpent, and the woman, uh, sorry, and the enmity becomes a him, and he will be bruised on his foot, but he will bruise the head of Satan, his power, his leadership. That's the fear of God. The fear of God is to hate evil and depart from evil. We continue, Proverbs 19, verse 23. The fear of the Lord leads to what? And he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. So we need the fear of God, the right kind of fear of God. I have three minutes. We're going to try and get through this really quick. I was going to do three angels in three minutes, I guess. 
Give glory to him. I want you to notice this. It's only after we have the right fear for God, which is essentially we hate evil, we see the sinfulness. Listen to me. Have you experienced the pain that sin causes? Then why do you still love it? Good question, isn't it? All you have to do is experience being a human and go, man, this stuff sucks. Being a human, like I have a seven-year-old son. I'm not going to finish this, I can tell now. I have a seven-year-old son. And we are on a little bit of a farm. We have some chickens. You've, all got, you've had chickens before? We hatched them, right? One of the chickens died. It hatched, it lived for a day, and it died. My seven-year-old son was so attached, I don't even know how, but he got so attached by that little chicken in one day that when it died, he cried for a week. And he, you know what his crying was? He kept, I, I, I'm a pastor, but I didn't tell him what to say. This is what he said to me. Every day for a week, we had a little prayer time and bedtime. He's like, I hate sin. I hate, because he asked Rebecca, why did it have to die? Rebecca's answer was, because of sin, things die. Now, in his mind, he's connected sin to that death and the suffering of the little chicken. Some of you like to kill chickens because you eat them, but that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> so he's looking at this little chicken, it dies, and he understands now that its death is because of sin. And in his little seven-year-old mind, he's like, I hate sin. I hate the devil. Why did he have to let my little chicken die? If he keeps that for the rest of his life, that perspective, he will be just fine. The problem is the older we get, we're so smart, we're so intellectual, we go, ah, oh, it's just a chicken. Yeah, old people die. Sorry, old people. <laughs> it's just a part of sin. It's part of life. We've lost the sinfulness and the hurtfulness and the horribleness of sin, and so we don't have that, that fear for, it, for God. Anyway, we're talking about the glory of God. Here's the point. Once you have that, that fear of God, guess what comes natural? Giving glory to God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says, whatever, therefore, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, and I'm not talking about eating and drinking, although I am. Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, or whatever you do, what does that include? Every single thing that you do. What's the text finished with? Do all to the glory of God. So what that text is teaching me is that I am now living a representative life that brings glory to God. We said the other day that glory is the character of God. So as I live my life, it is giving glory to the character of God. Why? Because I accepted the eye self. I accepted the white raiment. My eyes are open because of his teachings in the, in the gift of prophecy. And now I am following the lamb wherever he leads me in what I eat. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying you need to be vegetarian. Just don't eat blood and fat and unclean animals. And if you tried that, which I have, you will be a vegetarian. <laughs> I don't know if you've tried meat kosher, but it has no taste. It may be clean what you're eating, but does it have blood in it or fat in it? Because if it has, then you're in violation of what God has told you is good for your body. Now let's talk about drinking. Lord, help these people to know what they're drinking, whether it brings glory to them, to glory to you, or glory to them. Let your spirit tell them, in your name, amen. Whatever we do, we give glory to God, but that only comes after we have the right view of God and the view of sin. Are you with me so far? Okay, hour of judgment has come. I'm 20 seconds over. I'm going to go for a few more minutes and I'll be done. The hour of judgment has come. I've already said that one. Here, okay, let me just show you this real quick. The hour of judgment has come is the language that the 2,300 year prophecy has expired. Time is now no longer. We are living on experimental time now. We don't know how long the clock's going to last. And for those of you telling me last night that the world's going to end in five years, yeah, that's your problem. It's your prediction, not mine. That's not Jesus' problem. We're operating on God's clock, and his clock stops in 20, uh, 2018. That's uh, 2018. 1844. Time should be no longer. Now it's, he's just waiting for you to open the door to your heart. 
And he's waiting for you to open your door to the heart so that you will be an ambassador for him and take this gospel to all the world. So the hour of judgment has come. I'm going to skip that a little bit more for now. We're going to worship him. What I love about this is in, in Adventism today and in Christianity at large today, we are all about seeker-friendly churches. And we want to bring seekers to find God. And we bring them to churches and we change the way we do church services and we want to make it seeker-friendly and all that good stuff. The problem with this teaching is, I don't care if you do it, that's, your, that's between you and God. Let God lead you. God will do things that I don't necessarily think I see I should be doing, but that might be what you're doing. What I want to make a point of is this. When is worship brought up in the context of this gospel. It's after we understand the sinfulness of sin and the holiness of God. It's in the context of us having now lived lives that give glory to him without the way we're living our lives. And it's in that context that we're now invited to come and worship our creator and our redeemer on the day he set aside for us. Well, the problem that I see in Christianity at large is that we, we sort of turn that upside down. We think if we can get a non-Christian into the door of our church, we've done the gospel. What does that person know the first thing about worshipping a holy God? They don't. I didn't. I came from nightclubs, alcohol and all sorts of crazy stuff. If you knew, you wouldn't listen to me. That's where I came from. I, I walk into the church the first time. I was introduced to Homer Simpson. No exaggeration. On the stage in the church, Seventh Day Adventist church, there was a Homer Simpson guy dressed up with Homer Simpson, and they had, had all kinds of music to entertain the masses. And when I showed up, I'm like, what in the world is this? I, I was coming to find God, not to worship him. And I didn't know how Homer Simpson is connected to worshiping God, but anyway... Here's my point. I don't want to dwell on too much. We worship him because we know him. The seventh day Sabbath was not designed as an evangelistic opportunity because you're too lazy. Listen to me carefully. Because you're too lazy to do it any other day. Open up your home. Invite your seeker friend to come and have a meal with you. Get to know them. Let them see you and how you live and let them ask the question, oh, why do you pray when you get a meal? Why are you eating healthy food? Why are your kids so well behaved? That's what making a disciple is, living with people. Now, after a while of them doing that, they're going to ask questions like, well, who is this Jesus? Oh, I'm going to tell you who the promised king is. I'll show you why I believe he's the king. Well, what did he come for? I'll show you why he came. Well, what did he teach? I'll show you what he taught. Well, how do I become one? I will introduce you to being born again. Well, how do I worship this God? I'm so glad you asked. We meet every Saturday at 9.30 a.m. Well, some of you is 10. 9.30 a.m., 10 o'clock, and we have a great time of fellowship, a Bible study. We ask good questions. We don't just go, no, I haven't read it. And oh, by the way, we read memory verses. That's a good one. It's a memory verse that we read. Anyway. I've got a lot of hobby horses, but anyway. The point is, can you see what my point is? Worship comes after you know sin and you know God. So let that sink in. All right, I'm four minutes over. I've got to do two more angels. <laughs> Here's a second angel real quick. Babylon has fallen. Why? She's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. Let me, let me say this in all seriousness. The most, to me, the most important message of the three is the first. Because the first lays out everything. It explains to us what the gospel is. It shows us what sin is. It shows us who God is. It shows us how to change and live a life that is reflective of the robe that we're wearing now. That's the first angel. The second angel is awesome because it comes along and says, hey, all that confusion, all that man-made system, all that chapter 13, it's all fallen. Why? Because she made doctrine, which is the drinking of wine, and her doctrine is wrath of fornication. Fornication, the Bible, is an illegal union between two parties. The two parties that are fornicating here is church and state. Kings of the earth fornicating with the churches of the earth. They come together and their, wrath, their, their doctrine is wrath, which is this. I'm going to use the state with my religious power to influence you to worship. And if you don't, there's wrath. 
And Jesus is telling us, listen, angel number one is how I'm going to win this battle. They're going to hear the good news. They're going to know I'm the Savior. They're going to see the better view of holiness versus sinfulness. And they're going to say, I'm on board. That's his weapon. Number two is, listen, if you are still questioning this, that whole system that's forcing you to worship, it's fallen. Don't go down there. Right, that's an injustice. I spent a whole hour on this one, but we're not going to do that now. Let's go to the third angel. The third angel is cool. It's very long. It says, And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and has his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Notice there's two, two wraths coming which is poured out in full strength in the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. The funny thing, well, it's not funny, but the important thing in this passage is that this is happening in the presence of angels and the Lamb. The final scenes are in the presence of the angels and the Lamb. If you go back to Daniel chapter 7, the judgment begins in the presence of the angels and the Lamb. So the angels are witnessing this whole thing to make sure, not to make sure, but to see how just and fair God is. Then it continues on. And their bodies are tormented forever and ever. That's what it says, right? No, it says smoke. The smoke is the result of the, the judgment that was executed. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, meaning they're not coming back from the smoke, and they have no rest. It's funny because the issue is about worship, and worship is about resting with God and those who go along with the mark and the system of chapter 13, they think they're doing it for rest reasons, but they actually get no rest from it. Because the rest comes from Jesus. Jesus is the rest. Come unto me, he says. Um, who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives his name. And then it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here they are, those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So a really quick summary. Again, that's an hour into that one, but here's the summary. The third angel is really just this. Don't worship the beast. It's pretty black and white. And if you do, there's no rest. No, no, there's no eternal rest. It's, just, it's over. Um, the, the rest that Jesus wants to give. So in conclusion, we have this, this um, amazing slither of time cut out in the book of Revelation for our time, for your time, for my time. And we are introduced in these three angels what the actual message and mission of God's Laodicean people is and are. What's the most important thing I've shared all week? Laodicea. You get that message, you get those three things from Jesus, you'll be just fine. You'll notice the next chapter in 17 is the one world, the coming together of all the powers. We don't have time to talk about that. And honestly, it doesn't really matter. We might live through it, probably will, but it doesn't matter because the only thing that matters is that I am following Jesus wherever he leads me. People have asked me since yesterday's presentation, hey, what practical advice are you going to give? Should we, should we do this? Should we get, out of, get our money into gold or coins or should we go into um, crypto versus digital currency? Should we move into the country, all that stuff? Here's my answer. I don't know. Am I your prophet? Go read the prophet. Seriously, he didn't give us thousands and thousands of pages to open our eyes so you can come and ask Robbie what you should do in practical sense. That's your problem with God. Because my Bible tells me, and this is what I've done my whole last 20 years, is that I look at Jesus and Jesus goes, follow me, Robbie. I'm like, all right, I'm following the lamb wherever he goes. And it's led me all weird places. But here I am. So, look, one world government's coming, cryptocurrencies, I don't know if you should get into or not, I'm not going to say that. That's your, you talk to God, God will tell you. The goal I want you to leave with as we pray right now is this. You need Jesus more than any other time in human history. You need Jesus right now in your life. And you need to go to him and say, listen, I am a rebel. I've read this and I'm doing that. Where's the power? He says, ask, and I'll give it to you. And he says, better yet, I'm going to knock on your heart today, right now, I'm going to ask you, can I come in? Can I come in and do a work in your life? Can I give you that character that I talked about, the 144,000? Can I give it to you? Can you, like, train your eyes on my eyes so that wherever I lead you... By the way, Psalm says that God... Uh, David follows... The, uh, David says he follows God by looking at the eyes. That's pretty intimate, isn't it? 
So train yourself to follow the eyes of God and the Lamb and, and just, just let Him lead. If He tells you to do this and you know it's God doing it, you've got counsel from people around you, counsel from the Spirit of Prophecy, counsel from the Bible, you've prayed and God's opened the doors of providential leading, do it. If not, don't do it. Does that make sense? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, you are amazing that you have come down through time and space and through the gift of prophecy. You've spoken to our brother John on that island of Patmos so many years ago. It was his deepest and probably darkest moment, I'm guessing, from a human perspective, being isolated from people and, and friends and faith and mission. And yet you came down and you said, John, I've got something for you. I've got something special. I have never given something so special as this to anybody in the history of humanity that we know of. And I want you to write it down. And I want it to go to the world. And I want them to know that I am in control. I'm not letting this thing get out of control. I don't want it to be as bad as it is, but I'm not letting it out of control. I'm in control. Here's the story. Let me the details. And then today, as we've looked at, you, you're just amazing how you give us that Revelation 14, verse 1 through 5. No matter how bad it gets, just remember this. I win. And so, Father, as we've just unpacked just a little bit of this powerful message of the first, second, and third angel, forgive us for being so lackadaisical in appreciating what you've packaged into those, just those few verses. Forgive us for saying that we are the church of the three angels and yet not actually doing what it's, it's called to do, called to, called to communicate. My friends here have endured five hours over the course of this week studying this book with me, and I've been appreciative of their patience, but I need you, God, now to work in their lives. If every person here would embrace Jesus' counsel, this country would be turned upside down. That's my prayer, Father. You speak to hearts and minds. People want to know what they should do now. You know Please tell them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, um, some of you have been asking for slides and things. So first, I'm going to tell you two things real quick. You don't have to do any of this. There's no, you're not going to go to hell if you don't do it. Um, if you want to follow some stuff on, that I do on YouTube, which is some things like this, not everything like this today. This is the first time I've recorded this series this way. But subscribe to my channel on YouTube. And the second thing is, if you would like to get the slides for these five presentations we've done today, you need to take out your phone. Hopefully this works here. We'll take a picture of it at least. You can do it when you get home. But take out your phone and text 04884 So you get your phone, you go to the number 04884 and you type a message which just says Revelation. Just type the word Revelation and press send. And then I've got a, a um, bot that's in uh, Melbourne who will get your email address and then it will send you, it will start replying your text, it will, it will send you a link that you can go download all the PDFs of those presentations if you want them. If you don't want them, don't bother with doing it. All right, guys, well, that's, uh, that brings us to the end of a rapid fire, five part series is revisiting Revelation. I pray God will bless you abundantly as you go back and revisit this powerful book in light of the whole of scripture and the spirit of prophecy. And uh, we'll see you next time.